you, you are God's beloved. You are perfectly created in the image of God. Know that God fully accepts you and loves you for who you are. I hope it feels really good to hear those words, to get all like a little tingly, feel good, fill your heart up, fill up your bucket, as Anna used to say when she was in kindergarten. Those words and others similar to them have been part of our blessing this weekend that we have been offering at Pride Fest. Uh, many of you have volunteered uh, and um, People have come forward into our little booth. We have offered this blessing, and some people have taken us up on it. But those words are also meant for you this morning. From Matthew 22, 34 to 40. When the Pharisees heard that he had silenced the Sadducees, they gathered together, and one of them, a lawyer, asked him a question to test him. Teacher, which commandment in the law is the greatest? And he said to him, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your mind. This is the greatest and first commandment, and the second is like it. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. On these two commandments hang all the law and the prophets. And also from Romans this morning, 15, 5 through 7. We're going to skip ahead a slide because I changed it at the last minute. May the God of steadfastness and encouragement grant you to live in harmony with one another in accordance with Christ Jesus so that together you may with one voice Glorify the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. Welcome one another, therefore, just as Christ has welcomed you for the glory of God. If I cry this morning, y'all are forgive me, right? Because it is a powerful experience to hold a stranger's hand and offer them a blessing. Folks who are cynical, probably with very good reason, whose walls you get to see lifted for just a brief moment. Folks who are eager and excited to receive a blessing in all the ways that they need, smiling joyfully, calling their friends over to experience the same delight, and folks for whom it has been a long, long time, if ever, that a church person has held their hand and told them that God loves them and accepts them just as they are. It is gliding a glitter stick over someone's skin, sometimes, often over self-harm scars, reminding them that they, yes, they are God's beloved. I have often wondered what it would be like and how it would literally change the world if the institutional church finally got its act together and repented of our sins. Those sins where we have pushed people away abused people's trust, made folks feel less than, alone, and unloved, where we have said, you are not good enough and you don't belong here. What would it be like for our world if we came together and finally lived out God's commandment of love and a welcome in the way that God intended it to be. Friends, the church is imperfect. We already know this. It is imperfect. It is made up of us. 
imperfect people who have real problems and real struggles and none of us anywhere get it right all of the time. Even churches that are healthy and hopeful and loving on people all the time. Even those churches, churches that are us, don't get it right all of the time. We're going to make mistakes. We're going to miss opportunities. We're going to not always get things exactly how God wants us to. But the one thing that we should get right, the one thing that we should always get right, no matter what church we are, no matter what denomination we are, no matter what people fills its pews, the one thing as a church we ought to get right is by loving people and accepting them for who they are. The times when church has gone against Jesus' commandment to love our neighbor is so innumerable that we can't even possibly count those times this morning. I cannot count how many times as a pastor and a chaplain somebody has literally sobbed in my arms because some church person somewhere has convinced them that they are and always will be unloved by God. And it doesn't have to be about who you love. Today is Pride Sunday. It is something that we are reaffirming, that we are fully all in on here at Shawnee Community. But to be convinced that God doesn't love you has, doesn't always have to do with that or gender or fitting into society's constructs that we've made to box people in. Sometimes it's what we've picked up as children, bad theology taught to us by people we love, things we've learned from abusive relationships, what we've been told directly that we carry around, the shame embedded in our heart and doubt embedded in our heart about God. There are more reasons that people have been convinced that God doesn't love them than we have breaths to give this morning. There's a story that I may have told you before, but Reverend Angela Kabeb, a friend of mine, when she was 17, she had an abortion. Now, when she was afraid she was pregnant and she hadn't told her parents yet, she went to a trusted youth sponsor and asked for help. Didn't really get the support she was looking for, so she went to the pastor of this 2,000-member church. The pastor looked at her and said, there are homes for girls like you. After trying several trusted adults in her church, beyond those two, she talked with her parents and they made a decision about what to do and what would be best for her in her life. Some time passed and eventually that youth sponsor, whom Angela absolutely loved with whole, her whole heart, asked what happened to the pregnancy. Now, Angela responded that she had been mistaken. It was a false alarm. She'd never, never been pregnant, and she didn't want anybody to know that she had an abortion. She had a lot of shame about that. And so the youth sponsor quoted scripture at her. Get ready. She said, do not be deceived. God is mocked, for you reap what you sow. And continued her tirade by telling Angela, you'll never get away with what you did. Now we fast forward about a decade and a half. That whole time, Angela carried that judgment and that conversation in her heart and embedded into her very soul was the idea that God no longer loved her or accepted her for what she had done and God's punishment was just a matter of time. And so when her child was still born, Angela went back to those words of that youth sponsor and blamed herself because of those experiences so long ago. She believed without hesitation down to her very core that God was angry with her and had abandoned her and she was no longer worthy of God's love or God's acceptance or God's peace. Friends, the sin was not Angela's. 
The thing is, is it's never been God's intention to push God's people away, to shame people, to hurt people. It has never been God's intention to take away mercy or grace. It has always been God's intention to bring God's people closer to God over and over and over in whatever way was needed from creation until now. God has been at work trying to get humanity to understand and accept God's love and acceptance. We have this whole library of biblical literature at our fingertips that shows us time and time and time and time and time and time, and time again. God's presence, God's spirit trying to get humanity to understand that we are loved and accepted and welcomed into the presence of God, whatever. Now that literature takes place within a particular cultural context, but the message is still there. God loves us. God wants to be with us. God created us and God will always accept us. Full stop. Friends, look at some of the characters that God used in that biblical text. And I use the word characters purposefully because some of those folks are a real hot mess. Oh my gosh. God uses them though to express God's love, to assure everyone of God's continued presence. If God loves those folks, God loves us and God loves God's future people. God uses them to remind people of God's care and concern. And we have got to figure out by this point in time that when God has been hurt or when people have been hurt, God has been hurt. When God's people have been excluded, God has been excluded. When God's people have been told, you are not worthy or God is not going to forget what you've done. God has been deemed not worthy. When God's people have been alone and unloved and abandoned, God has been alone and unloved and abandoned. Friends, it is the intimate and sacred work of the Holy Spirit weaving God's love into all of our lives. And it is the work that we here at Shawnee Community Christian Church, it is the work that we have been called to by God to be a place of refuge and rest, to be a place of acceptance and wholeness and healing, to be a place of love and compassion for whoever needs it. It is why we exist as a faith community to create sacred, safe space here and wherever we are is the people of God so that God's love and acceptance for all people are made known in a world that is hurting. Now there's lots of places in churches and out of churches where, the, where God's message of acceptance is drowned out. You can't hear it. There's lots of ways that folks are made to feel like they don't belong, but let us be faithful to God's call to do the work of God, sharing that love and acceptance to each and every person who needs it. Amen.